invited to the first initial Zoom meeting for the Hershey Civil Roundtable. Let's hope this all goes well. Uh, just at the beginning, just to let you know what, what I'm going to do, just uh, right after I introduce Joe, what I'm going to do, I'm going to hit mute all. That way we don't get any background noise. And during the talk, if you have any questions, if you notice you have where the chat button is, you could ask a question. And then what Joe will do at the end, we could go through the question unless Joe wants to answer the question when he sees it. But we'll basically save the questions to the end. Um, I guess the biggest question, if does everybody know where the, the little chat button is so they, they can bring it up? If they don't, if you look on your little participants, you, you could give me a no because I just want to make for sure we got everybody. Got it. Okay. Because basically, if you look down at the bottom, you have a little toolbar that says chat. If you click that, it'll come up with a box. And down at the bottom, it says just type a message. Yeah, Tom says he sees the good. And that, the good part is when you ask the question, your name will come up. When your first name, what's ever on your your, your system. Okay, so well, we'll get started. Uh, I don't know if everybody knows Joe Boz. He's going to be our speaker. He's both a member of the Hershey and the Harrisburg Civil Roundtable. And tonight he's going to be talking about Little Round Top. So, uh, Joe, why don't we just go ahead and, and what I'm going to do, I'm going to, I'm going to, now I'm going to mute everybody but, but Joe. And then, Joe, like I said, when you're ready for the next slide, just just give it, just give me a yell. Roger. Okay. It's all yours, Joe. Okay. Welcome, everybody. Really appreciate you being here for the uh, inaugural attempt at uh, our uh, program tonight. <laughs> but, okay. Joe, I just hit you on mute. All right. I'm unmuted. Okay. Everybody else is muted. Okay. But uh, very nice having a chance to be together because considering all the coronavirus stuff, there's a lot of people that aren't able to do anything. Uh, we're going to talk about the battle at Little Round Top tonight, uh, Hold That Ground at All Hazards, which was uttered by Strong Vincent to uh, not only Mr. Chamberlain that's on the uh, PowerPoint, but all of his other uh, regimental commanders. Everybody knows something about Little Round Top, but uh, what's interesting, I started reading about everything that was out there and found out there is a lot of inconsistencies. There is uh, information that seems to be uh, not covered or uh, some information that uh, wasn't interpreted uh, according to maybe consensus thought. So I decided after reading pretty much everything that was out there to put pen to paper and maybe see if I could do something with this. Next thing I know, after about six and a half years, I've got a manuscript in front of Gettysburg Press and uh, still and have most of my uh, image permissions uh, taken care of, which is a big step. Uh, I, I didn't realize all the things that are involved in putting a book together. The easiest part seems to be research and writing. But my purpose uh, in this program tonight is to share with you some of the things that I found. Uh, one thing looking at this illustration, this painting is done by Keith Rocco and it's called Hold That Ground at All Hazards. Uh, Strong Vincent is the fella in the kepi on the right side holding not a sword, but his wife's riding crop. And he had that during the entire battle. The fella on his right or left of him is Joshua Chamberlain, uh, the famous commander of the 20th Maine, and you'll find out that uh, Joshua Chamberlain wasn't the only famous guy at the Battle of Little Round Top, but he was one of the few that lived and was able to tell his story many times over as uh, time went on. One thing I want to draw your attention to is the movement of the troops uh, sort of down the slope, and then you'll see in the upper right corner a vapor trail from uh, an artillery round. When uh, Vincent and his uh, bugler all-around gopher guy, uh, Mr. Norton, who wrote uh, the book, The Attack and Defense of Little Round Top, 
first appeared on Little Round Top, they were taking artillery fire. In fact, uh, Vincent told Norton to get behind the rocks. They were attracting too much attention. But you'll see the direction that round is uh, arcing and also the movement of the troops. There are some people that think 20th Maine and the rest of Vincent's brigade went around the east side of Little Round Top and up an old logging road uh, that ended up somewhere around the saddle between Big Round Top and Little Round Top. But this illustration, and a lot of these artists worked really hard to get this stuff right, shows that they didn't come from that direction, and we're going to cover this a little bit more. All right, next overhead. All right, period view of the round tops. And uh, during the battle, Little Round Top was not Little Round Top. It was called pretty much everything else. George Meade called it Yonder Hill, but it was also known as Granite Spur, Granite Hill, uh, Rocky Ridge, Sugarloaf Mountain. Uh, and it's the, the hill there in the, for, in the background to the right is Big Round Top. And you see that slope. This photograph was taken by Matthew Brady about a week and a half or so after the battle. He's actually standing on the left side of that photograph by that tree on the left side with the cart wagon by there. Uh, he appeared in a lot of his photographs. But you see the slope, uh, there's no trees or hardly any trees. This was uh, forested about a year or so before the battle. Uh, there's four people that owned this property. Uh, Bushman, Jacob Weikert, uh, Hugh Scott, and uh, Ephraim Hanaway, uh, they logged this pretty regular because there were brick kilns in Gettysburg. People needed wood for their fireplaces and buildings and so on and so forth. The eastern slope of Little Round Top was all forested, and uh, it stayed in forest, but however, there wasn't not a lot of ground cover because Ground that was not uh, cultable, uh, they used it for free-range grazing of their animals. So a lot of the ground cover is not present. The trees are there, but it's very similar to what you might see in uh, the uh, Schwarzwald or the Black Forest in Germany, where they actually have people maintain the forest. And this picture is taken from the vicinity of Crawford Avenue, and Wheatfield Road, which we'll talk about that a little bit more too. Next overhead. Two days after the battle, Timothy O'Sullivan took this view somewhere over around uh, Halk Ridge near Plum Run, looking up the slope, the New York uh, 44th and 12th Regiment Monument would be on the uh, sort of right side of this image and straight up would be uh, maybe where the artillery pieces are placed on top a little round top. But you can see just a few days after the battle how clear this slope is. I've walked this thing a number of times and I'll tell you, the briars and the bram brambles and the stones, uh, the stone, by the way, is diabase granite, which is pretty doggone hard. But they used a lot of these stones in the 20s and 30s, uh, 1920 and 30, I'm sorry, uh, to build some of the roads, not only around the round tops, but other places in the park. So some of the places where you see rocks or you don't see rocks, and people said they were hiding behind them, they were there, but they were using them for road gravel. All right, next overhead. Modern day view. This is taken from the base of Houck's Ridge just off Devil's Den. And you see the uh, New York 44th and 12th Monument up there on the uh, right side. Uh, you can see some of the artillery up on the slope. But uh, those trees in the foreground on the base of uh, Little Round Top were not there during the battle, as you saw in the other images, pretty clear. Uh, the height of this hill was somewhere between 170 and 185 feet. Just for those of you who are historians, that's about the height of the Leaning Tower of Pisa, if that uh, <laughs> piques your interest a little bit. Uh, big Round Top was about 130, 135 feet higher. I've used uh, not only period maps, but modern USGS maps, and even then it uh, can vary a little bit depending where you take your reading from the uh, Plum Run Valley, and that's 
plum run running across the uh, front of the image just on the other side of the road there. And uh, you'll, you'll see if you, you start walking from Plum Run up that slope on Little Round Top, it's going to be quite an effort. The uh, slope here is pretty severe. On the eastern side, it's uh, uh, pretty gentle. And from the uh, north access and south access, because of the saddle between the round tops, it's a little bit easier to negotiate. But this, uh, I know some guides walk their people up the roads. Uh, uh, if you're down there by yourself, try to walk up this slope. It is unbelievable. And people were fighting there. And, and a lot of them said, even if there wasn't anybody up at the top, they would have a hard time negotiating it. Okay, remember this position was the extreme left flank of the Union line. And the reason was Mr. Sickles uncovered it, moving his third Corps out to the Peach Orchard and the Emmitsburg Road because he thought he did not have a very good position. And this goes back to Chancellorsville, which I don't have the uh, time right now to go into that. All right, next slide. This is a Dale Galleon image, which uh, I got permission to use as well in uh, my book. These are the uh, second United States sharpshooters. And they worked in teams of four. Uh, this was the elite of the uh, Army of the Potomac. These guys uh, were truly sharpshooters. They had green uniforms. And those knapsacks were uh, fur on the outside, which was amazing. Uh, that... Uh, uh, the, the, the regular issue of the Union Army wasn't good enough. But these guys with their Sharps 52 caliber, uh, 1859 breech loading rifle, special sights and double set triggers, they uh, cost about 42 bucks a piece. The uh, standard arm of the Union Army, Springfield 1861, 58 caliber musket was about 20 bucks a copy. These guys could hit a pie plate from rest at 200 yards. That's a five inch circle. And uh, they also had other, with, with 10 rounds, they also had another test from uh, an offhand position. But uh, I'll tell you, if you take one of these rifles at rest and try to hit a pie plate at 200 yards, you're doing pretty doggone good. But these guys were essential on delaying the attack of uh, mostly the 15th Alabama and Law's Brigade, that if they wouldn't have been there, that's a slider farm there in the background, by the way, as a point of reference. Uh, and they're in the woods at the base of Big Round Top. Uh, there would be no battle at Little Round Top. These guys delayed them enough that they uh, changed, actually, the course of the battle. And uh, they didn't take too many casualties. They still fought the next day at Gettysburg. Uh, there was another group of them that were over on the Emmitsburg Road with Sickles, and uh, they stood their, their position well, too. Okay, next uh, uh, overhead. All right, this is uh, Phil Leno's map out of the Gettysburg Campaign Atlas. Uh, it's the only outside map I'm using. I redrew pretty much all the maps because that means I have to the position of the 83rd Pennsylvania, pretty much everybody had it off. I'm not going to get into a lot of discussion on this because uh, these movements are very complicated, but uh, you'll see the, uh, the 48th and 44th Alabama, and I can't even see the type, on the extreme left flank of Law's Brigade down near the bottom left, are cutting across the uh, axis of attack by most of Law's division. Yeah, uh, the cursor's on it now. Uh, in order to fill a gap that was being created by the attack of uh, Hood's division. And Hood was to try to find the, the left flank of the Union Army. And as they started to engage, uh, they found out there was more people out there than they thought there were even though uh, there was a, a reconnaissance done by Captain Johnson, but it was eight hours old. And of course, Hood and even Law wanted to do another reconnaissance, but it was refused. Uh, they were supposed to go ahead with their attack. 
and take a chance. And uh, of course, taking chances in combat's not a good idea. You usually get into a lot of trouble and you usually get people hurt. Okay, next overhead. This is uh, Evander MacIver Law. Uh, educated at the Citadel, pretty smart guy. And he majored in military arts. In fact, he was so good, uh, he started his own school at uh, Tuskegee, Alabama. And guess what else happened at Tuskegee, Alabama? But uh, he was one of the young commanders of the Confederate Army, uh, not just at Gettysburg, but anywhere. This guy was sharp. Uh, one of the things that he was uh, petitioning for was to uh, both Hood and eventually Longstreet was that he didn't think this was a good thing to do, that they may have been able to go around Big Round Top, uh, and, and that if they were even successful in their attack, that they might not be able to hold the position or even improve it, uh, that a frontal attack was unnecessary, that the, the, the occupation of it uh, would would cause a problem and that the other routes around would be a lot easier to handle. Somebody's waving their hand, Holly. Uh, and that such a movement would compel a change in front on the part of the enemy, ban him in a strong position and force him to attack us. And MacGyver was no dummy. I mean, the Confederates were famous for hitting flanks, but he realized that, you know, that in the best case condition, let the Union attack us. We can prepare a position and just tear them up. Well, the, the, it was all reversed. Uh, the Confederates ended up attacking the Union, and, of course, eventually we know what happened to that. Uh, next uh, overhead, we're looking at uh, Governor K. Warren, uh, not to be uh, strange to pretty much any of us. Uh, he met Meade after Meade found out what Sickles did, moving his position from the southern part of Cemetery Ridge out to Emmitsburg Road. And, of course, Meade was not only frustrated with it, he had to try to figure out what to do. So while they were there having a meeting, uh, they heard some uh, activity over on their uh, left. And uh, Meade said to... Uh, Warren, who was the chief engineer of the Army of Potomac, why don't you go over there and see what's going on? And then more importantly said, hey, go take care of it. I mean, and, and that's as close as you're going to get to an order about, hey, do your job over there if you find out what's going on. Meade had that much trust in Warren. So Warren, and this was about 3.30 in the afternoon, Warren headed over to a little round top, and we go to the next overhead. Uh, some of you are really familiar with this image. It's an illustration by uh, Mr. Wode, the uh, famous artist. And as they said, it's an on-the-spot sketch. And any of you up on Little Round Top will recognize this area. That odd-shaped rock behind Warren is called Signal Rock. And you'll see the two signalmen on the right. And Warren's standing on a rock, and then he has one of his aides down below him. Uh, the current walking path on Little Round Top goes between Signal Rock and where Warren is standing. Uh, to the, the, in this image, to the left of Signal Rock is the rock that Warren's statue is on. And there's a lot of people that go visit the battlefield and think that's where Warren was. Well, uh, no, there were sharpshooters down in uh, Devil's Den, and as they moved their way up Plum Run Valley and uh, over Houck's Ridge, they moved up also. So this spot got pretty hot later on in the battle, and of course, Warren was no dummy. He was not going to stand up there and get shot at. And really, the sharpshooter activity didn't pick up till the uh, Union artillery under Hazlitt uh, moved up there. And that was after most of the battle was uh, completed. But a lot of people, when they look at the Warren statue, and it's uh, eight foot four inches high, they think Warren is that tall. Uh, 
Warren was actually a pretty small guy. He was about 5'3", five, 5'4", five, about 140 pounds. Uh, had sort of dark skin. A lot of people thought he was an Indian. But uh, he wasn't going to stand up there and get shot at. And that's roughly the position he was in. And you can stand on that rock today. In fact, I was up there taking photographs because I wanted to see what he would be able to see. All right, next uh, overhead. Aha, uh -huh. we got three gentlemen here that don't look like they're anybody, but they are all pretty famous too. They had a lot to do with uh, getting troops up to Little Round Top on Moran's orders. Uh, you got Chauncey Reese, who was sent off to me to ask for help from the uh, Fifth Corps. I'm sorry. Yes, Fifth Corps under Sykes. And we have uh, Ranald McKenzie, who had the toughest job. He had to go off the sickles and try to beg some units from him, which didn't work too well. So he went on down the line and ran into Sickles people or Sykes people. And uh, Sykes said, yep, he apparently had heard from Meade at that time and realized that the fifth Corps was going to try to support the third Corps. And then down at the bottom, we have uh, Washington Roebling. Uh, quite an effort to try to get copyright permission to use this guy's image, but I had to go to Rensselaer Polytechnic. So what do you expect? But uh, Washington Roebling, uh, yep, the same guy that did the Brooklyn Bridge, and also uh, happened to be Warren's brother-in-law. He was married to his sister, and uh, he was pretty close to Warren, obviously not just because of marriage, but through the war, Roebling uh, acted as his sort of chief aide. But uh, getting all of these people out and, and trying to locate troops was, was quite an effort and, and absolutely uh, impressive. Okay, next image. Uh, Colonel Strong Vincent, the man. Too bad he didn't live. He could have told a heck of a story. And that's the thing about the battle. Some of the more prominent people, in fact, ones who were making decisions that were critical to the battle, didn't survive it. Uh, he was waiting to be able to support, uh, and you'll see on the next image, waiting to be able to support Sickles. And I'll show you the rough position that they were in. But uh, Vincent was a native of Waterford, Pennsylvania, which is just below Erie. He started at Trinity College in Connecticut and ended up graduating from Harvard. He read law and was admitted to the bar in 1860. Now, I don't know whether uh, many of you know about reading law. It's sort of like a, an extended internship. Uh, there were some schools that had law programs, but basically everybody learned sort of on the job. You went and found a lawyer, you worked with him, you did all his grubby stuff and ran his errands and shined his shoes. Then after so long, you would get the, an oral test to see if you knew enough to be able to handle yourself in a courtroom. And what was interesting, uh, Lincoln, who was a lawyer, uh, supposedly gave a final test to a candidate while he was taking a bath. So I'm not sure how formal some of this process was, although a lot of schools in the Northeast actually had you go through an exam and uh, uh, recitation in order to prove your abilities. But uh, he was commissioned a lieutenant colonel in the 83rd PA, uh, which was an Erie-based unit, Erie County, Erie City, and uh, was with the unit uh, the whole time up to Gettysburg. He was uh, stricken with malaria during the Seventh Days campaign, and that wasn't unusual. It seems a lot of them had problems with that. Didn't rejoin the unit till Fredericksburg, and by then uh, he became the colonel of the brigade or the uh, regiment. Lightly engaged at Chancellorville, he then became the brigade commander. First Division, Fifth Corps, the Army of the Potomac was reorganizing for what would be the Gettysburg campaign. All right, next uh, image. Aha, uh -huh, new map. Uh, I'm a map guy. I like to draw maps. I like to read maps. I like to collect maps. You won't see this map anywhere because all these maps are new. The position along the stone wall uh, of Vincent's Brigade, you see John T. Weikert uh, in the upper center of the image. They came down that route. 
Some people have them stopping in Weikert's fields, but they carried on through to that stone wall by the wheat field, getting ready to support what was going on with sickles. Also, they needed to clear that area because the Confederates were down in the southern part of Plum Run, firing artillery rounds up into that area. So some of these other positions that some of the authors have from that standpoint, uh, tell me if how much any of you enjoy sitting under artillery fire. Uh, Civil War cannon or not, it's not exciting because you never know where the rounds are going to impact. And of course, you never hear the one that's going to take you out. But I feel, and, and, and a number of other authors feel the same thing, that this is a, the, the best uh, estimate on a position that they were before they headed off to their positions on the uh, south slope of Little Round Top. Now you see the route that they took, Wheatfield Road. Uh, one of the things that helped confirm this, one of the soldiers in the uh, 83rd PA said that they crossed Plum Run twice. So coming down a Wikert Farm and over the Plum Run to get behind the stone wall is once and going back over it again is twice. It, it's amazing, sometimes you find little nuggets or tidbits and when you're in doubt about uh, some information, this, this is one way to maybe uh, sway you one way or the other. Uh, they went down a wheat field road, cut in almost right where the park road is now, which is Sykes Avenue, but it wasn't exactly there. Uh, the Park Service really tore up a lot of stuff putting these roads in, but you know, without that access, how many of us would love to be tramping through the woods? I mean, uh, I, I like to use the park roads as I have on these maps, these images, to give you some idea of where you are relative to the modern roads. Also, uh, the, there's a, a hiking trail, and they use it for horseback riding as well. And, and it roughly goes down that trail, but it doesn't follow it the whole way down to the position that the 20th Maine uh, finally took. Uh, which is called the Spur, Vincent Spur, but it's interesting that Chamberlain was actually on the Spur. But following that down behind the crest, and uh, Chamberlain actually described the fact that they were moving along the crest, behind the crest, and while they were doing that, they were taking artillery fire. So the Confederate batteries over around Devil's Den and, and some that were over around Emmitsburg Road were actually firing on this position even before anybody got in position because of Vincent showing himself on, on the uh, plateau and uh, just other activity over there with the signal station and so on. Now you'll see the positions that they took on the southern slope of Little Round Top. You have the 44th New York, 20th Maine, uh, and the 16th Michigan on that right flank or left flank, right side of the image, and then the 83rd Pennsylvania in front of that. Now, everybody is uh, probably wondering now, how the heck can you get those people in those positions? Well, you start reading a lot of stuff, and it seems the more modern images uh, or more modern authors uh, share this opinion about the 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 order of march and also the positions on that south slope and i'm talking about some fairly heavy hitters uh alan Gueldo, uh miss uh alice trulock who's uh, probably written one of the best biographies on joshua chamberlain in the american civil war and uh, a guy by the name of uh, james hall who wrote uh, a book on the united states army at gettysburg well researched uh, a lot of help from the military on putting together this story. But the uh, authors uh, back in the 1890s and the early 1900s seemed to favor another order of march. And uh, when I was looking at the information, uh, I was looking at several things. W one was uh, when they got in position on the south slope, and, and the, the order that was screamed at everybody on the right by file in the line, there's only one way they could have come to get in that position. And there's also 
only some certain order the way they ended up on the south slope of Little Round Top. And what I look at, too, is a, a thing called Occam's Razor. I don't know whether you've all heard of that, but that's basically if you get a lot of complicated information and scenarios about something, usually the, the easiest solution is probably what happened. Of course, there's a lot of people that will confirm that this is what it was. Now, I'm not done with that yet because if you get out and read the New York Monument, which I don't know whether you can see the number two on, on the image. Let me see if I can get it there. See the number two right there on the south slope, a little round of the crest. That two is the New York 44th and 12th Monument. If you read the base of that, it says the line of the 44th New York is roughly 30 yards down the slope. Or you read some other, it says 100 feet. So we're talking between 90 and 100 feet. And I'll show you an image here in a minute about where they settled themselves. Okay. Now, Pennsylvanians, <laughs> this is a tough one. A lot of people, uh, including one author, Ken Disconfano, who was a retired police officer, but did a heck of a job doing some research and wrote about a 115 page uh, uh, treatise on the battle. He makes note of the Pennsylvania, 83rd Pennsylvania being formed sort of a half circle or a bowed line a little bit down the hill from the 44th New York. If you go down in that area and you find uh, the, the 83rd PA monument, and I'll show you that in a minute, on the monument, it says in front of this monument was the position of the 83rd PA. And it's mentioned also in Norton's book, Attack and Defense of Little Round Top. And then something that's really fascinating, there are actually flank markers for the 83rd PA down in that swale. And uh, those markers were supposedly set by the veterans. And, and the only thing that I'm frustrated with is I couldn't interview Vincent to find out why he put him down there. And nobody from the 83rd reported that position. But you look at all the information that's out there. That's the only place they could be. I looked at the line that they had. There's no room to squeeze the 83rd in there. If you take a, a normal regimental front with two ranks, no way can you get them in there. You start squeezing everybody in and ended up with three ranks. Of course, that's not going to work because Napoleon said too many people get killed. Plus, the reason for the two ranks is the length of the, the musket they were using. But I am still looking for other information. One of these days, I may find something that's more definite. But I don't know. With what I found, I think it's pretty dog, doggone definite as it is. Okay, next image. Ooh, what happened to 83rd Pennsylvania? Did I miss that one? Sure. There we go. All right, I must have missed the map. We'll get to that map in a minute. All right, 83rd Pennsylvania. Uh, this monument is just off both the uh, Wheatfield Road and the, uh, the Warren Avenue. You can walk to it. Uh, the monument itself says about the Pennsylvania Regiment in front of the monument. And guess who's on the top? The Monument Commission would not allow a statue of Vincent or anybody else, a regimental, to be put there. But the 83rd decided they wanted him up there. Now, one little fallacy with it, he's reaching for his sword. Uh, his sword was still in the scabbard on his horse. Uh, he was actually reaching for his wife's riding crop. But uh, good image, uh, well done work. I, I just love to visit the monument and just uh, say a few prayers for everybody. All right, next image. We can go forward, Ricky. All right, Orpheus Woodward, he was commander of the 83rd Pennsylvania. Uh, he was captain, filling a uh, yeah. lieutenant colonel slot. And uh, Orpheus was pretty solid, good guy. Obviously, he was from the Erie area, had uh, grown up in the military with uh, Vincent. 
And uh, th this guy did an absolutely solid job at uh, Little Round Top. All right, next image. Okay, somehow these got out of order a little bit, but no problem. This is a walking path from, in the distance, you see that tall tree on the left side. This one right here. That supposedly is a witness tree, although uh, not been confirmed, but I've had a few licensed guides tell me that is a witness tree. This marker right here is the left flank marker of the 16th Michigan. So from that marker back this way on this path is the line of the 44th New York. This tablet here indicates a spot where Vincent supposedly was killed, but uh, we're going to get into that a little bit later. It's not in the right spot. Uh, Vin Vincent was over in here somewhere, not back here, but they, they put the monument up before anybody was checking too many things. But uh, this is a winter picture. I got a summer picture. It's great. You can see what it's like with the vegetation. This wall along here was probably built after the battle on the second uh, most of the troops threw up a few rocks, but they didn't have anything this developed. Or it could have been put up by the Civilian Conservation Corps in the 30s, where they were trying to restore the battlefield. And some of these uh, restorations weren't exactly too accurate. But it still gives you a good line. You can walk this path, even in the summer, and look down the hill down this way and see what it looked like with the 83rd below, sort of like a tiered seating you know, in a football stadium with the 44th above the 83rd Pennsylvania. Fascinating concept. Just love to talk to the strong Vincent and see where he found that in the military tactics manual because I haven't found it anywhere in anybody military tactics, including Casey's and everybody else's. Okay, next image. All right, let's go back to the uh, map. That's, that's two back, Ricky, I think. Bingo. Okay. All right. This is where uh, everybody ended up. The only change in this, I added the Confederate troops on the left side. They're attacking from the uh, southwest to the northeast. You have uh, 15th Alabama over here in the 47th. They were up here on Big Round Top. I'm not going to get into all that, but uh, the 15th Alabama with uh, Mr. William Oates wanted to stay up here and turn this into a Gibraltar, but uh, uh, one of Law's adjutants told him, get your butt moving. We want you down in here, and we want you finding that flank. Here you have the 4th Alabama, 5th Texas, and 4th Texas. These two guys were part of Hood's Texas Brigade. All of these troops, and the, and the 48th was part of uh, uh, Law's Brigade. All of these troops were battle-hardened. They were tough. They were some of the best troops that they had in the Southern Army. All right, we have the 83rd there. We got the 44th New York. We have a 20th Maine. And then over here, we have a 16th Michigan. What do troops do when they first hit a position that they think they're going to be there for a little while? They throw out skirmishers. So everybody put skirmishers out. 83rd, 44th, 20th Maine, they all had skirmishers out. 20th Maine lost some of their skirmishers. They ended up over here behind this wall under um, Morrell. The 16th Michigan, Benson ordered them over to the right flank because I believe he saw these troops moving up through the edge of Big Round Top, through this draw, and up into this position. Uh, and he was not putting his worst troops on the right flank. Some of you know uh, military tradition is you put your best troops on the right side. I don't know where it came from, but Napoleon mentions that too. 16th Michigan had a lot of experience. They were tough. They were from the Detroit area. They could handle themselves. They were very reliable. Only one problem when they put them over here, after they lost two skirmish companies over here, they were down to about 180 troops. They were the smallest of the group. And obviously you see this flank over here. It's pretty much in the air. There's no troops over there. There is no terrain to anchor yourself on, but Vincent felt he needed to get these guys over here in a hurry, and they were actually taking fire while they were moving over into that area. This side here, 
after they left, the 20th Maine extended themselves around this slope, but not as far as what some authors have diagrammed. All right, next, uh, next overhead. Okay, I think we missed uh, Joshua Chamberlain, who everybody knows. There he is. Uh, everybody knows who Joshua Chamberlain is? Good, I won't get into that. No, he, uh, he did a heck of a job. He was one of the heroes. Uh, but there were a lot of other heroes that day, too. But Chamberlain was lucky. He had two very good lieutenants, and we'll get into that a little bit later. But uh, he was uh, a, a civilian soldier. Uh, he basically, uh, uh, as, as Bob had told me, he was a burger. I knew that, but he was also a minister. Uh, he was uh, a... Uh, a elite educator in, in the, the, what I call soft liberal arts subjects. Uh, I'm a graduate engineer from Penn State, so we look at everybody in liberal arts and social sciences as sort of cupcakey stuff, although I know better than that. There's, there's some tough things you got to get through. But he learned his military stuff by studying nighttime and also he had a mentor, uh, Adelbert Ames, who some of you have heard of with the 11th Corps. He was also uh, at Gettysburg uh, with Howard's uh, group on the North Gettysburg Plain. Uh, but uh, throughout the first few years of the war, these two were together because Ames was a Mainer as well and a sailor. And uh, Joshua would go over and study with him and also read every book he could get a hold of, and that's how Vincent learned his craft, too. A lot of self-study. These were smart guys, though. They could handle it. But uh, with, with Ames, uh, at the time at Gettysburg, he was a general, and uh, Joshua was a colonel. But some of the basics that they learned, and I won't get into a lot of tactical stuff because uh, this just isn't the place for it right now, but the basics of defense, such as uh, holding the high ground, Positioning on a military crest, and most of you know what that is, you don't silhouette yourself against the, the uh, uh, sky or background, uh, and you're able to uh, depress your fire down to the base of the slope. If you get up on the actual topographical crest, sometimes you can't see the bottom of the hill, and that's where soldiers can sometimes uh, hide themselves for a little while before they're ready to attack. Uh, Missionary Ridge is one of those examples where the soldiers in those fire pits at the base of the hill hid down along the base, and the Confederates were up on the top of it. They didn't even know they were coming. Uh, other things that you look at is uh, protecting the flanks, very critical. Uh, most of the military teachers at the time, uh, Jean and uh, Frederick the Great and Napoleon, uh, a lot of flank attacks. Uh, Napoleon used cavalry, basically, but Jean talked about troops. But uh, concealing movements of the troops between the wings, uh, good view of the enemy's movements, and uh, if you have to leave, have an unobstructed uh, line to, to get out of that position, save yourself for another day. Uh, quickly, order a battle. Uh, we have... Uh, 1st Division, 3rd Brigade, 5th Corps under Vincent. We have a 20th Maine with about 386 soldiers. 16th Michigan with 263, but was reduced to about 180 online after the two companies were sent out as skirmishers. Uh, the 44th New York with 391, 83rd PA with 295. Total 1335 originally with uh, Vincent's Brigade. 2nd uh, Division, 3rd Brigade, Fifth Corps under Weed came in later to 140th New York. They brought the 453 people with them, but the 453 people didn't have the impact. It was two companies that had the initial impact, and we'll talk about that later. Uh, order of battle for the Confederates, Laws Brigade of Hood's Division, Longstreet Corps. Uh, we have 4th Alabama with 346, 15th Alabama with 499. Uh, they bled off so many troops that actually uh, Chamberlain was complaining about being outnumbered, uh, fighting against the 15th Alabama. But by the time Oates bled off troops for various activities, 
they were almost uh, pretty even. And uh, so he really didn't have a leg to stand on there. Although at the time, you know, I've been in combat. Uh, you think there's 20 times the guys out there that are shooting at you uh, until you start seeing people. Uh, the 47th Alabama had 347. And uh, the 4th Texas, uh, who was part of the group, had 415. And the 5th Texas had 409. Later on, the uh, 48th Alabama joined the group. They had uh, 347. So basically totally engaged uh, initially was a little over 2,000. And then after the 48th Alabama joined them because they were part of the movement up the Plum Run Valley, uh, that added uh, another uh, 380 some people. So uh, sides, not, not too uh, this. Not, not too far apart on the numbers, but of course the union was holding the high ground. So that's what it's all about. All right, next uh, image. Next one. All right, these are uh, Mr. Chamberlain's two lieutenants. These guys deserve to have hero status as well. Both of them were from his neighborhood up near Brunswick, Maine, uh, Spear, Ellis Spear, uh, the individual on the upper left, and uh, Holman Melcher uh, on the lower right. Uh, Spear had Chamberlain's left flank, and Melcher had his right flank. And we'll talk about their activities a little bit later. Okay. Uh, let me see where I am. Okay. All right. Next, next picture. We got uh, Mr. Oates. And I think that was out of order too. All right. Uh, 15th Alabama, one of the best fighting units in the rebel army. They were from Southeast Alabama farm country. Organized at Fort Mitchell, Alabama in August of 1861, Oates being voted commander from the start. So there was no uh, change of commands or whatever. He was with them from the get-go. Uh, over the winter of 1861-1862, they lost 200 troops to uh, disease. And as a lot of you know, there were almost as many Union soldiers and Confederate soldiers died from disease and, and non-combat issues as, as they did from combat. Uh, they fought in and were present in every major action uh, involving General Longstreet. They finished the war at Appomattox Courthouse with uh, 17 officers and 170 men under Captain Eli Clower. Uh, Oates had moved on to the 47th Alabama. I won't get into his background. He was quite a character. I think uh, any of the books that you read on his life will uh, certainly be of interest. Uh, the, the best one is uh, maybe the one that he wrote. And there's a lot of really good information in there that uh, can help uh, explain you know, some of the things that he did during the battle, especially when he gave the order near the end of the combat to, uh, to leave their lines, although his first order was, hey, we're going to hold out as long as we can. All right, next uh, photograph. We have uh, Mr. Rice, Colonel Rice, commander of the 44th New York. Uh, he was a uh, graduate of Yale and a practicing attorney. And he was nicknamed Old Crazy because when he got into combat, he got all excited about things and often made mistakes. But not this day. He did a heck of a job. He took over for Vincent when he was taken down, but uh, Rice was solid. He was a senior colonel, and uh, he was somebody that uh, Vincent relied on strongly up to, including the time when uh, Vincent was taken down. Okay, next image. All right, this is called a diagraph. It's a combination of a photograph and a diorama done by Dennis Morris, uh, Rochester, New York. I have uh, three of these images in my packet. I own one in my own collection. 
and uh, fascinating. Gives you a pretty good idea of what maybe it looked like. And uh, he has worked hard to be very accurate. That tree you see on the upper right side is that pine tree that some people think might be a witness tree. So you see their line right there. They were supposed to anchor it on a big rock in that vicinity. Over in here where the cursor is, is roughly where the 16th Michigan is. But you see their line all spread out, and the title of it is uh, Ellsworth Revenge, uh, where uh, their, their first commander, Colonel Ellsworth, was uh, shot trying to invade a pub down in Alexandria, Virginia, where the tavern owner put a Confederate flag up on top of the place, and the tavern owner took a shotgun and uh, caught up with Ellsworth on the stairs and shot him. Interesting. Okay. Uh, next image. 16th Michigan. This is one of my favorite images of the, the whole packet. This is a painting done by uh, Todd Price. I'm still trying to get with Todd to get permission to use this in the book. But this is so inspirational. Uh, and this is actually their position on Little Round Top. And the title of the painting is Bringing Up the Colors. I think when you uh, look at uh, what is taking place here, uh, this is the essence of battle. Uh, as I said before, I was in combat in Vietnam. It didn't look quite so romantic as this is. But I'll tell you, combat, whether it's Civil War or Vietnam or Korea or Afghanistan, my youngest son had two tours in Afghanistan, both involved combat. It, it's not a, a terrific thing. Uh, it's the worst thing you can possibly go through. But you look at the expressions on the soldiers' faces, I think Mr. Price caught the, the, the emotions of the moment very clearly. The 16th Michigan, by the way, was uh, not a slouchy unit. These guys were good. Uh, they had been in all major battles of the Army of Potomac, uh, and they were in battles to the end of the war. They did an uh, absolutely great job. Their commander in the next image is uh, Norval Welch. Uh, a lot of fuss about this guy, especially from uh, Mr. Norton, because supposedly Welch took 40 some of the troops and the flag and left their position. And there's a lot of confusion about this. Uh, with the 140th coming up over Little Round Top, uh, Welch was holding the right flank of Vincent's brigade on Little Round Top. He was being hit by the 4th Texas and the 48th Alabama. And a ratio of uh, soldiers was uh, about four to one, not in Welch's favor. And they were hitting the flank. And supposedly... Welch, where somebody in his group heard somebody from behind, they thought it was either Sykes or Weed, they weren't even on the mountain, uh, telling them to pull back. Uh, all the readings that I've done, most modern authors think that Welch was trying to refuse the flank. In other words, bring the two or three companies that were on the right side of the line back in a position roughly 90 degrees so they wouldn't have to give up the position that they still can continue to hold. Well, what happened is they started to move back into that position. And this is what most authors think that the, the fourth Texas and the 48th Alabama hit them just where they in the middle of this movement and Welch pulled everybody back. Now, one fuss that I have, although uh, Norton gives them back some credit because uh, the fact that, he, uh, he died at uh, Petersburg in 1864. There's another fellow I'd love to talk to. Uh, by the way, he was the, uh, he graduated in the first uh, class of uh, uh, lawyers at the University of Michigan, place where they do play some football. Uh, why he didn't stop at the topographical crest. Uh, one of the reasons why you're put on the military crest is a retreat position is you can go back to the topographical crest. But he didn't do that. He kept going. He ended up over in a Bushman farm and didn't reconnect with the unit until the next day. 
but the rest of the Michigan, 16th Michigan, stayed because the 140th New York just came down at the right time and allowed them to hold their position, which they did. In fact, that they did hold the position and allowed the 140th New York to hit these two Southern regiments just at the right time. Uh, Welch, uh, interestingly enough in his history, and I'm not going to go into all of his background, but he was actually court-martialed by the uh, initial commander of the 16th Michigan, a guy by the name of Stockton, for uh, fining a soldier for not participating in the great snowball fight February 1863 in the vicinity of Fredericksburg, uh, Virginia. And uh, guess who Welch was defended by <laughs> was Strong Vincent in the in the hearing, and Vincent got him exonerated of all charges. So uh, Vincent and Welch had a little bit of history too. Okay, next image. Fourth and Fifth Texas. See that tree right in the middle? There we got the witness tree again. So get, getting more evidence that the painters absolutely love that tree. It's a great reference point. But uh, 16th Michigan is here, and over on the other side of it is the 44th New York. Right up, in, right up in here is where the New York Monument is today, the castle, as they call it. But here is 48th Alabama and the 4th Texas, moving up the slope. All right, next image. Okay, there's the New York Monument, the castle. And the reason I selected this picture, and uh, these, these appear in uh, uh, Gettysburg magazines, is you see a flank marker right there. That is for the 16th Michigan. That is their right flank. So from there over is the position covered by the Union, the Union Army and Vincent's Brigade. This area here uncovered, if you walk this, and you can get down to this marker and come down into here. The rocks are fairly flat here. But this whole area up through here, even looking down from the top, see right there is the top of the uh, O'Rourke Monument. This area here, I call it the slot, because on that whole slope, this is one of the flattest places for you to move up that slope without too many obstructions. And that is where the 48th Alabama over in here and the 4th Texas over here broke through that part of the line. But also where this O'Rourke Monument is, that isn't roughly where uh, O'Rourke was shot. He was shot down in here. But anyway, and I'll cover that a little bit later. But here is where the 140th New York, two companies of it, moved down through to stop this attack. All right, next image. Okay, positions uh, just as the 15th Alabama was hitting the right, the, the, the left flank of the Union Army, but the uh, center and left flank of the 20th Maine. You see the 4th and 5th Texas have just pulled back. Numerous attacks along this line. Uh, some of them attacked four or five times, and they called it Indian-style fighting. But I don't think uh, some of these attacks were attacks. They were just pulses off of attacks that they would hit and just drop back a little bit and then hit again. You see the 48th Alabama over here. They, they were basically flank protection until they moved in with the 4th Texas on this next attack. This was about 520 in the afternoon, roughly uh, about a, a, a half hour or so after the battle started. 4th Alabama, their commander got shot. Uh, they sort of laid back a little bit. 47th had the same issue. Here's a 15th Alabama trying to push his flank. And over here behind this stone wall where you can walk down from the 20th Main Monument, about 120 yards in the, in the woods, lots of big rocks, a little bit of a slope, you will see the 20th Main, Company B. This is Morrell. He went out originally as a, uh, a skirmisher and got caught with a 15th Alabama coming down this way, so they moved over here. Also, about 12 to 15 of the uh, U.S. second U.S. sharpshooters. Uh, when Law was chasing them up the hill, some of them got caught and went down this way, and other ones, another part of the second U.S. sharpshooters went this way. 
and they all got back together again later that day or, or the next morning. But 12 to 15 of these guys, the sergeant asked after he connected up with the 20th Maine Company B, said, hey, can I fight with you guys? So they all hid down along this stone wall. Now, you get down that stone wall, it's not that high. It's probably about two feet, might even be 30 inches tops. But I'll tell you, in any kind of combat, if you think somebody's looking at you, you can get down really low and kiss the dirt. But uh, with all the foliage and the rockiness, uh, these guys didn't even know they were down there. I mean, it, it, it was even during the battle, I think these guys were sniping at the 15th as they started to try to move around this flank. All right, next image. Oh, yeah, the real hero of the battle, Patrick O'Rourke, one of my favorite guys. He, uh, the boys of Monroe County, Rochester area. O'Rourke, he was born in Ireland. He went to West Point, uh, graduating in 1854 at the top of his class. How about that? Foreigner finishing on top of the class in 1861. Uh, anybody know who finished last? <laughs> I, I think it was Custer. I'm not sure. But Custer was not one of my favorites. Uh, anyway, he had uh, seen uh, the run. He was staff officer early. Uh, in September 1862, they were forming a new regiment, 140th, and he was offered command. <laughs> and uh, the regiment was involved in light combat at Fredericksburg and Chancellorsville. But Gettysburg would be its first serious action. I don't think they had to take a backseat to anybody the way they responded. O'Rourke was not only a competent commander, but his unit was well-drilled and had a high level of discipline and morale for a volunteer troop. These guys were hot. And I'll tell you, one of the best books to read is the uh, Monroe County Boys uh, about the 140th New York. Uh, next picture, I think, is going to show. No, it won't. Next, next image. Okay. Here's 140 coming Two companies of it coming down the slope, a little round top. Guess what we got in the middle of the image? There we go. This is a Dennis Morris uh, uh, di di <laughs> picture again. And the these rocks are still here today. In fact, I think he copied most of those. But as they're moving down the slope, two companies, as they were marching and following the track uh, with uh, Warren's son-in-law or uh, brother-in-law uh they were separated by uh the the artillery moving up the slope of little round top at the same time and only two companies got loose now how did these guys get up there great question uh warren was not real sure that he had enough troops up there he was still standing in the vicinity of Signal Rock, and he was looking all around the battlefield uh, toward Wheatfield Road. And that's one of the reasons people go to Little Round Top. You can see a lot of stuff up there. Uh, he saw the head of Weed's Brigade heading sort of northwest on the road, on Wheatfield Road, to back up Sickles' position. So he thought, geez, I'll run down there and see if I can grab some people. Well, by the time he got down there, 140th New York under O'Rourke was the last group in line. There's some controversy about this that they weren't the last in line, but most of the modern authors say they were the last in line. The other three regiments moved on, and as uh, Warren was catching the unit, he recognized O'Rourke. And he had relations with 140th before, and he and O'Rourke knew each other. So O'Rourke was a little reluctant to hand over the regiment, but Warren said, hey, I'll take all responsibility. I need you guys. So he sent Roebling uh, with them to direct them to the right place up on Little Round Top, and Warren chased after Reed, uh, uh, Weed to get the rest of the brigade back to help him on Little Round Top. And again, you got to remember, he had the authority to do this. When uh, when uh, me told him, do what you got to do. But uh, this is one of my favorite images of the battle. Everybody talks about uh, 
you know, Mr. Chamberlain, well, these guys did their service too. In fact, if they wouldn't have shown up when they did, uh, the Confederates would have caused a lot of problems on Little Round Top. But uh, two companies, and they got separated by Hazlitt's artillery uh, because they were moving up at the same time. Uh, nothing Warren had to do with, although he did end up getting hit with a round while he was up with Hazlitt's artillery and wounded. But the reason only two companies got through right away was because Hazlitt's line of, of guns interdicted their regiment line. These two companies and uh, one of the soldiers in the company, uh, Porter Farley, who witnessed the scene and commanded Company G, as he crested the top, said, war's wild panorama spread before us. The air was saturated with sulfurous fumes of battle and was ringing with the shouts and groans of the combatants. So there you got a guy that was right in it. Now, these guys made their attack. They might have had a little time to get organized, but not too much. Uh, their weapons weren't loaded. Uh, there were no bayonets really ordered to be placed on a weapon. They just slammed into the 48th Alabama and the 4th Texas. Just a mano a mano. Uh, the Texans had uh, rounds in their weapons, and in their initial volley took down O'Rourke at the front of the group. And uh, the spot where he was shot was very similar to where uh, Vincent was shot, which was behind the line of the 16th Michigan, because a number of observers, including Mr. Farley, said that O'Rourke fell near where Vincent was shot. Of course, there's a carved stone on the crest of Little Round Top that has these individuals' names on them. And uh, most authors seem to think that this is where Vincent was carried after the battle or, or after he was shot uh, to try to get him out of harm's way a little bit because he was wounded severely through the hips and thigh groin area. Uh, one author says he was shot in the chest, but I think his grad students made a mistake and didn't do enough research. But uh, Vincent lived until uh, uh, July 7th, five days after this combat and was actually uh, posthumously uh, promoted to Brigadier General. Some people think he was uh, conscious, and a lot of people, they weren't sure he was conscious. But anyway, they hustled their promotion through, and he died as a Brigadier General, if that's any consolation. Uh, and uh, O'Rourke was uh, supposedly taken down in about the same position, which is a shelf. If you're on top, a little round top, on the uh, walkway or trail, you can see down when you look at the 16th Michigan position, sort of a shelf or a flat area, and down there seems to be roughly the area where this all happened. All right, next image. Okay, here shows uh, the uh, Hazlitt's artillery moving up, interrupting the uh, route of uh, the uh, 140th New York. Here's the two companies being released and smashing into the 48th Alabama, 4th Texas. 44th Alabama, which was part of uh, Law's brigade, was not actually involved. They were just flank protection. Uh, they had most of their casualties fighting in this part of uh, Plum Run Valley. Uh, I believe the 4th Maine was down in there. Uh, but they did not get engaged, the 48th Alabama and the 4th Tech, because there's still Union activity up in here. But you see the final positions uh, pretty much. Uh, here's the 15th Alabama. And uh, Waddell, at, uh, late in the battle, at about 7.05 p.m., that's roughly about two hours after the initial contact, trying to move around this flank. And here we still have the 20th Main Company B and the U.S. Sharpshooters behind the wall. They will release pretty soon. But you see these guys are bending back 20th Main's line. In fact, uh, Chamberlain asks, uh, Woodward of the 83rd Pennsylvania, if he could extend, if he could give him some troops at first, he said, no, but he said, I'll extend my line so you can move yours a little bit further. And that's what happened. Uh, Orpheus Woodward moved his line a little bit over this way, gave the 20th Maine uh, an opportunity to move their line this way. I have seen some illustrations that show this line bent like a jackknife. If you walk that territory down there, 
you're going to find out that there is not a lot of room up on this spur for them to be on this flat part. And if they are, the Southerners are shooting straight across their position. That did not happen because if it would have, these people over here would have had some real problems. They were down at least along this contour with the Southerners still below the slope. So they were shooting upward and not into the back of Melcher's troops over here on the 20th main right flank. Okay, uh, next image. All right, here's Stephen Weed. I'm not gonna talk about him too much because he didn't last too long. He only got up to Little Round Top after uh, the other three regiments of his unit uh, appeared. The 140th uh, was joined by the 91st PA, the 146th New York, and 155th PA. Uh, while they were standing around the artillery position, he was shot and wounded, died that night. Uh, his buddy Hazlitt, uh, who uh, was handling the artillery, was dressed in some light clothing, and supposedly Hazlitt bent over weed to get some last minute uh, instructions of what was going on and his personal effects of whatever and got shot while he was leading over weed. Most, historic, most modern historians believe Hazlitt got shot while he was either on his horse or he got off his horse because he was in light enough clothing the snipers could see him. And at 7 o'clock, roughly, when this happened, I've been on that battlefield at 7 o'clock. And, of course, that's 8 o'clock our time, Eastern Standard Daylight Saving Time. You can see really good. And the snipers down in Devil's Den, especially somebody in light clothing, no problem. And this is when Warren got wounded, too was being up around that artillery because they really weren't taking heavy sniper fire, even though the signalmen were taking intermittent fire up till then. And Warren, when he got wounded, they say snipers hit him. No, he said that he got hit with a, a, a round ball, not a mini ball. But Weed and uh, Hazlitt actually were hit by snipers. Okay, next, uh, next overhead. Hang on. Should be a map. The map. All right, final positions of the troops. All right, now I, I want you. Here, here's the rest of Weed's brigade right here lined up. A, a lot of map people have this line down here. It's not down there. If you get up here on the slope, you will see all the <laughs> markers yes, up here. <clears throat> and the 16th Michigan still held their position there. What I want you to focus on is this position here. Here you got Spear, who was back in here, moved around to this position to attack the 15th Alabama. And I'm not going to get into the discussion between uh, the 15th Alabama and Oates ordering his people back before uh, Chamberlain's people hit. It's, it, it's so uh, time close that anything could have happened. In fact, issuing any orders over here, which Oates said he did, you couldn't hear for squat. And, and same thing with Chamberlain. He was issuing orders and shoot, nobody could hear him either. But anyway, Spear was over here. When they were ordered to attack, they really weren't ordered to attack. Melcher came out here, asked permission to recover some cartridges from the fallen soldiers and some weapons uh, because they said they were low on ammunition, but they actually weren't low on ammunition. They had, they had enough. Uh, neither Spear nor Melcher said that they were low on ammunition. But you have Spear on this flank, and Chamberlain talks about a wheeling maneuver, right wheel, swinging gate, all kind of crap. Uh, the fellow that you wanted to talk to was the guy that did the movement, Spear. And he said, it wasn't like that. He said, what we did was, basically, I ordered the guys to hit uh, Waddell's troops and he said it was like the whole line just threw itself down the slope because part of them went that way east toward the Jay Weicker Jr. farm lane and the other half went down this way and of course one thing that I uh, have tried to point out is one source said that Chamberlain told Spear 
what to do here. Not true. And Spear said that. And when it was executed, it was a textbook maneuver and not hardly. Go ahead and try to do a swinging gate maneuver in the woods over there. And these troops were well drilled, well trained. That's not going to happen over there. I mean, I've done maneuvers with just a small group of, of v Vietnamese uh, rough puffs. And to get them to put one foot in front of the other sometimes is pretty tough. And that they swept like a swinging gate, and that was not exactly. So all the things that Chamberlain said about this weren't exactly true. And that, that's one thing after the war that uh, Melcher and, Melcher and Spear uh, helped keep Chamberlain's memory accurate. All right, to finish up, uh, you can leave that image up if you want, Ricky. Uh, casualties, uh, Union, uh, which included Weed's Brigade, 481. Confederate, which included the, the two Texas units of Robertson Brigade, 738. Uh, and uh, the, the casualty rates, Confederate were 31%, which was pretty average for the rest of the combats the Confederates got involved with. Casualty rates for the Union were about 27%, which were a little lower than what the average was for the Union in, in other combats including Culp's Hill, North Gettysburg, Plain, uh, so on and so forth. Uh, what value, little round top in the grand scheme? Uh, I'm, I'm not going to make any guesses here. Most, most authors say it wasn't that important, although to a soldier, any kind of combat's important. It was, it was as good as any other combat at Gettysburg. I, I feel it wasn't any better and it wasn't any worse. It was hard fighting. And you're talking about pretty much all of these units here, very experienced and very tough and not giving up. Like the 16th Michigan, after the three companies pulled back for whatever reason, the other companies stayed in line, even though they were taking four to one ratio in, in combat. Uh, the, the 83rd and the 44, 83rd PA and the 44th New York were absolute anchors. These guys didn't move a budge. And the 20th Maine under Chamberlain, they did a great job. I don't argue that. And oh, by the way, anybody's interested in where Buster Kilrain is, uh, he was never part of the his, the real history of this. He's in the Hollywood Cemetery in California. Yeah, yeah, Killer's Age was right. But he was patterned after a sergeant in uh, Sergeant Buck in the Chamberlain's outfit. And this guy did strike an officer, but he got shot at Little Round Top and after he got busted down, Chamberlain actually promoted him on the spot uh, back to a sergeant. Uh, one of the things that I look at with a battle is you don't always have to win to keep yourself in a good position to keep the other guy honest and create enough doubt that the other guy loses his will to continue their actions. I'll tell you, it was a pretty close run here. If the 140th would not have shown up when they did, it could have gotten real interesting. Now, I say interesting, they might not have been chased off because the rest of Weed's brigade was showing up and quite a few guys there. Plus, over on Tawny Town Road, less than a mile away from here, were roughly about 14,600 troops of the 6th Corps who were already ordered to support this 5th Corps position. Uh, Warren, while he was on Little Round Top, and I've done a timeline thing with Warren, called Where's Waldo in my book, because this guy was all over the place. He, he just did an outstanding job. But while he was up there, part of the time, he was actually uh, giving uh, one of Sedgwick's uh, Sixth Corps adjutant officers a, a, a sort of overview of what was going on with the battle. So the Sixth Corps wasn't that far away. And if things would have gone south here a little bit, believe not figuratively, uh, Sixth Corps was there to support, and they were ordered to support the Fifth Corps. So uh, them taking it over, very unlikely because the Confederates, they were it. Gonna get pretty okay, uh, that's, uh, that's about all I have. One final statement. After the war in 19, uh, 1888, Oates did, a, did some kind of a letter-writing campaign with Homer Stoughton, who commanded the second United States sharpshooters wrote uh, somewhat ironically quoting uh, Victor Hugo, uh, two great armies in battle are like two giants in a wrestle. A stump, a projecting root, or a tuft of grass may serve to brace one or trip the other. 
On such slender threads does the fate of nations depend. And you know who that tough to grass was, was the second U.S. sharpshooters. They really changed the mix on this whole thing. All right. Thanks, everybody, for being part of this. I see we have more than uh, 13 participants, and that's outstanding. Thanks, Ricky. Thank you. Okay. Oh, what I'm going to do, like, if, if you guys have any questions, uh, why don't you, in the chat room, write some, uh, write it down, and I'll answer the question. Also, I'm going to just pop up my email address. So if, if anybody here doesn't isn't on our email list, please put uh, send it to my email address. And again, let everybody know your email goes nowhere. We keep it privately. And if you have any questions, just jot it down in chat, and then we'll get Joe to answer them. I sense something on chat. I don't know if it came through. Go ahead. I'm going to... If you want to unmute yourself, go ahead. I've got the thing. So if you want to unmute and ask a question, just let's don't try to overlap each other. Uh, Joe, this is Steve Smith. Uh, uh, I don't have a question, uh, just a comment. Uh, uh, that was excellent, and I want to thank you for helping to validate this Zoom experience uh, experiment. <laughs> uh, I think we've got Hershey uh, out of the starting blocks here, and uh, it uh, it was much clearer the second time around for me, uh, I guess because I wasn't worrying about <laughs> being the host this time. Uh, and being able to have these uh, these maps right in front of me on the screen was very helpful. Do I have a question? Do have one question? Uh, what's the difference between topo versus military crest? Topo topographical crest is the exact top of the hill, mountain, whatever. The military crest, and I did explain it, was a position where you could see the base of the hill, not silhouette yourself against the sky or background, and a position where you could control all the movement down below you. And a lot of times on hills, they might be the same, but on most hills, as you'll find out a little round top if you walk it, is that you have to get off the topographical crest or the top of it where the walking path is and walk down below it maybe 20 to 30 yards to where you can see down to the base of little round top. So that's the difference between the two. Okay. Hello. I don't know if you can hear me. Yes. Uh, this is Jack Chittister. I sent a uh, uh, chat note there. I don't know if it came through, but I just want to thank all you guys who put it together. I am a total amateur, but very interested, also a Vietnam veteran. And I want to thank you guys for uh, elucidating this very well. Um, I have one question, though. I'm, I may be totally confused, but most of the maps sh that I am looking at that you projected show big round top below little round top. I thought little round top was at the very tail end and the most southernmost or to the total left of everything. Am I not understanding things correctly? The, the images that we showed in the very beginning of the presentation showed their relationship to each other. Big Round Top, as indicated in the map, is south of Little Round Top and actually the higher elevation by about 130 to 135 feet. Next one, there you go. Big Round Top is on the right side of the image, yeah, where the cursor is. And Little Round Top is where the cleared western slope is where the battle was fought. Big Round Top was totally forested. There was no way that it could be used for military purposes, although the Union Army, after they chased Law's brigade back off of the battlefield, had to occupy Big Round Top for the next day because the Southerners were active at the base of it. But for military purposes, it was really a crap position you couldn't see bananas from it, and it was not a good artillery position because you put any guns up there, uh, you couldn't see anything to shoot at. That's another thing about Little Round Top because it was cleared off. Everybody thought it was a good artillery platform. It was, it was crap, literally. The most guns that you could put up there effectively was a, a section or two guns, although the Union uh, 
ultimately got four guns up there. There's a question about whether the other two guns of the battery did show up, even though the Park Service has got them all up there. But there's no room around those guns to work them. You know, recoil, those things kick back 8 to 12 feet. You need room around those guns to work them. And they were three-inch ordnance rifles. And, and they kick. And they weigh 1,800 pounds. You don't want one rolling over your foot. The other thing is if the Confederates would have taken the hill because of the, the angle or the line of the clearance, they could have only had two guns over there, and they wouldn't have had any effect on it. Most of the guns, the reason I didn't talk about the artillery and Hazlitt is that they really had no impact on the battle. They were firing over at Houck's Ridge. They helped Crawford in his attack, but uh, they, they did, did nothing really for Vincent or Weed's brigade while they occupied Little Round Top. Just a quick one for, uh, who was just, I have to ask a question. Just for your information, if you'd like to, since you're a Vietnam vet, we do have a Vietnam roundtable, so you have my email address. If you send me the email address, I'll give you the information. We meet the second Thursdays of every month. Maybe again, or we'll go back to Skype. Uh, and the same before I forget, if anybody has any you know, comments, concerns, uh, send it to me on, to my email address. Uh, because again, as we go along, we're to constantly improve. And Joe, there's one other question that I see here: Were Union taken, were Union Union taken prisoners and hauled off with the Confederates' retreat? Retreat. And this is from Bill from Perry. Uh, there were a few Union prisoners taken, uh, mostly the skirmish groups. Uh, and yes, as far as I know, they if if they could walk, talk, and whatever, they were taken. Uh, the Confederates didn't want to fuss with any wounded, and uh, obviously uh, they had their own problems with their own people. So uh, in all my readings, uh, it was only some of the skirmish people uh, that, that picked up. O Oates thought he was being attacked by cavalry, but they were actually some of the 16th Michigan skirmishers from their first position wandering around behind the cows and uh, couldn't find their way out and they got picked up. No Joe, questions, this is, this is no questions about the water detail, huh? <laughs> this is George Deitch. I'm from Erie. and Oh, George, I love you. You're one of my favorite guys. <laughs> I'm, as for the rest of you, I'm the uh, executive director of the Erie County Historical Society. Um, can I just throw a few rapid things at you? Absolutely. You're, you're one of my best guys. I love your stuff. <laughs> thank you. Um, uh, thank you for putting up the Hold the Ground at All Hazards um, uh, print. Um, we in Erie produced that um, back in 1995, working with Keith Rocco. And um, it, uh, selling of those prints actually produced the uh, uh, money for the statue that we have up in front of our... Uh, Bayfront Library of Strong Vincent holding his wife's writing crop. Okay, so, um, you know that we that's of course we love that there. Um, quick uh, uh, comment on the uh, Vincent marker that you showed. Um, I think from my research, I will say I think pretty conclusively that spot, which was marked by the 83rd Pennsylvania when they came back in '88, um, was. They knew Vincent was there because that was where he had his temporary brigade headquarters. Once he was shot around the other side of the hill, the first place they brought him back to was his brigade headquarters. So that marker does not say he was, it says wounded, but doesn't say wounded here. So I'm, I'm convinced that the flat rock just to the north of the 44th New York is indeed the place where he was, um, he was mortally wounded. Um, there was a uh, man in November at the time of Lincoln's um, uh, famous speech who was on Little Round Top who recorded that that uh, uh, was sketched into the flat rock. And so I think it obviously had to be sometime before that. I'm, my feeling is that that was a contemporary scratching into that rock. I think that's where he was wounded right near, as you said, where Rourke was. They, they got him off that area, which was still under heavy fire, 
moved him over to his brigade headquarters. That's where the 83rd saw him. And then that's where, because they were right below that, that's why they erected the, uh, this, the small tombstone-like monument there, which, by the way, was the second um, uh, monument ever erected on the battlefield. So just a little bit of, of esoterica there. Um, yeah, you clarified that. I don't, I don't disagree with any of that. There's so many uh, anecdotal stories that sometimes, you know, you just got to go with what you think really happened since I've been in combat. You, you can't be dragging people all over the place. You're taking fire. You got to still command people in combat. And it gets a little wild. Yeah. So, um, and I'll do one more quick shout out about Vincent. Um, when he took responsibility uh, for moving his troops to Little Round Top, of course, Barnes, his division commander, was nowhere to be found. The fact that Vincent showed up, got his skirmishers out less than 10 minutes before the Confederates hit those skirmishers, I think that was the real difference there. Um, had, you know, had he not gotten there first um, and the Confederates were walked up on there, you're right, it wouldn't have been a very good platform, but, you know, uh, nearly two fresh brigades of Confederate troops would have been awfully hard to uh, uh, push off that hill. Yep. So you've got to give Vincent, you know, the, the credit for taking the responsibility and getting there more. I put my email up on the uh, Zoom chat. I've got a couple of other thoughts, and I won't uh, take everybody else's time, about Norvo Welch and the, and the flag bearer of the 16th Michigan and um, whatnot um, that I'd love to share with you. Um, one last quick thought, you know, you mentioned the 83rd's line. You said, why did they, why were they there? Um, and uh, the fact that everybody was kind of squeezing together. Um, if you, when you don't have the foliage up um, and we have knocked it down, our group from Erie, Bell from Erie, who had weighed in before has been having folks come from Erie for more than 20 years to uh, do um, work on Little Round Top. But um, uh, when, and, and when they did that one controlled burn, there is an, there's a absolutely stunning line of rocks um, just above the swale, just uh, uh, north of the swale where the 83rd set up. And um, once you see those rocks, you can really know why the 83rd set up there. It was a, it was an outstanding defensive position. Um, in addition to the fact that it was slightly elevated and they did have a defense in depth. Well, like I said, the presentation about the park service using a lot of the rocks on the battlefield to build the roads. That is one of the areas where it seems a lot of rocks are missing that should be there because you would not set up, without some kind of cover in that position. Of course, the Confederates didn't have any skirmishers out. They just bludgeoned themselves down the hill. And thank God that Vincent did have his skirmishers out because that was early warning for what was almost an immediate attack after they got themselves settled. But I would okay. like to join your group, George, when you get down there to brush and grub. I'd be happy. Well, um, Bill, who's also online from us, is the one that uh, organizes that uh, from Erie every year group going down. Just give me the dates. I'll be there. I love that place. Well, would you, um, uh, my email's up there. Would you send me your email and I'll communicate with you then? Yes, sir. Thank you. And again, uh, I have your email anyway. <laughs> <laughs> really enjoyed your presentation. Thank you very much. Okay, is there any, any other questions? Okay, if not, Joe, thanks a lot. I appreciate uh, you giving us the talk and everything. Very good and informative. And like I said, if anybody has any qu further questions, just send me an email. We'll pass it on to Joe. I can also put it on our website and also on our uh, Facebook. So. Guaranteed I will get back to all of you. George, I will find you very quickly. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs>